Where can we find the most complex and sophisticated laboratory of all? Where can we begin to understand the history of the solar system, the beginnings of life? Study how materials behave in extreme environments with pressures of a million atmospheres and temperatures hotter than the surface of the sun. This laboratory is our planet, Earth. We are only just beginning to untangle the hugely complex web of physical and chemical interactions that link the interior of this planet to the biosphere, the atmosphere, and to us. So it's really no substitute for actually coming out into the field and seeing what these rocks look like. Because it's the observations we make that help us develop an understanding of how this planet works. What happens when ice at the pole melts or when CO2 levels rise? We really need to understand the history of our planet to be able to predict our future. The spirit of wanting to know why and to take nothing but evidence in what you see in the objects, in the, in the animals, in the, in the anatomy and then the rocks and in the plants, that's where you find the answer to the questions. As an earth science student in Cambridge, we'll be teaching you not just the things we know already about the earth, but training you to discover all of the things that we don't know. Volcanic eruptions are some of our planet's most awe-inspiring, yet destructive natural events. But they link the deep Earth and the biosphere via their role in the carbon cycle. The rising magma brings up carbon dioxide from great depth and releases it into the atmosphere. Over tens of millions of years, weathering removes most of this greenhouse gas and it ends up as calcium carbonate sediment on the ocean floor. When the carbon cycle is in balance, the Earth's climate is stable. But our use of fossil fuels is adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere so quickly that our planet can't keep up. How can we find out what the consequences might be? The atmosphere has contained abundant carbon dioxide before, notably about 70 million years ago, during the Cretaceous. These chalk cliffs are made of billions of minute fossils of phytoplankton that used calcium carbonate for their skeletons. They flourished in a carbon dioxide rich atmosphere. By measuring the ratio of the different stable isotopes of oxygen in this carbonate, we can tell how warm the oceans were. It turns out that the Cretaceous world was much hotter than ours. A greenhouse world with no ice caps. Sea levels were 100 meters higher than they are today flooding huge areas of the continents. Decoding the chalk like this builds our understanding of our dynamic planet. Studying the Earth doesn't only have relevance to the problems we're currently facing. We can start to piece together how the planet works on much longer timescales. How did we get from a homogeneous mass of rock in the earliest days of the solar system to our highly complex planet that's differentiated into an iron-rich core mantle and crust. So a fundamental process that results in the kind of planet that we have today is the creation and migration of melted rock. Now an excellent example of that is provided by the kind of crust that forms the floors of the oceans. So this is made by the pulling apart of tectonic plates and what that does is force the underlying solid mantle to move up and as it moves up and depressurizes that triggers melting and the kind of melt that's produced is called basalt. And that basalt moves up and solidifies to form new oceanic crust. And what we can see is this big fracture here that's filled with basalt. This injection here has got sharp sides. So that's telling us that the host rock behaved in a brittle way when this came in. It was cold. If we look down here, we can see evidence of a much earlier injection of basalt melt. Look at this thing here. This hasn't got those sharp sides. This has got much more diffuse sides and it came in while this bit of early formed oceanic crust was much, much hotter. So this raises some interesting questions. How are these two injections related? Did they come from exactly the same source? Did the source melt to the same degree to make these two injections? Those kind of questions can only actually be answered if we take samples of this material back to the lab. Using precise machinery, we slice the rock so thin that we can see right through it. A key skill for decoding each rock is learning how to interpret what we see down the microscope. These larger crystals are of a mineral called olivine. 
The smaller crystals are of a mineral called plagioclase. If we put these under two Polaroid sheets, then you can see that you get some bright coloration to them. And these colors are down to the interaction of the polarized light with the crystal structure. If you look here, you might be able to, to see these little circular features. They're little droplets of magma that get trapped as the olivine crystals are growing at depth in the chamber. Now, by looking in, in detail at the composition of those, we can determine that the magma chamber where these grew was about 30 kilometers depth. So that's where this magma came from before it burst towards the surface for eruption. The key to understanding how our planet works is an interdisciplinary approach. A broad scientific foundation means Earth scientists can make discoveries at the points where the traditional disciplines overlap. These days, the natural sciences are becoming more and more and more one. And that is a very good thing. For example, you look at a Cretaceous or Jurassic coral reef, and you also look at a living coral reef. The two work together so that the coral reef alive today tells you the processes which were in action when they laid them down, and the geologist can give you the perspective of what happened to that reef over a million years. What I love about being an undergrad in the Earth Sciences Department is you get to use really advanced technology in your degree. This is an electron microprobe. It fires a beam of electrons at the thin section and measures the x-rays that are produced. By measuring the energies of those x-rays, you can work out the composition of the minerals in your rock and therefore work out where the magma came from. The main starting point for any Earth scientist is observation. We apply our understanding of physics, chemistry and biology to connect clues and reveal patterns that we can use to build up a hypothesis. This is really the only way to go if we want to find out about the far past, when there's nothing we can use for direct comparison. For instance, there's been nothing on Earth like this Tyrannosaurus rex for 68 million years. What were these animals really like? Detailed observations provide the key. It's really clear that a skull like this is that of a huge, powerful predator. I mean, these huge spaces here behind the eye are for enormous jaw muscles. Those jaw muscles are going to be clamping these jaws together and they're equipped with these huge sharp teeth. The skeletons and skulls of animals, even like dinosaurs, are not made of solid bone. Uh, they're rather intricate three-dimensional structures with holes in various places. The question is why? One way of investigating that is to actually take um, a scanner and take a three-dimensional image of a skull and then try and deduce from that the way in which the bone is organized and the way in which that can transmit stresses and strains during the lifetime of the individual. One rather interesting thing that's popped out of investigating this skull is that there are peculiar little puncture marks. There's one just here on the side of the, what's called jugal, and that is exactly the same shape and size as the tooth of a typical T-Rex. That's an example of actually these T-Rexes fighting. And the fact that it's healed over means that it wasn't a fatal wound. The animal has actually recovered from that injury and gone on to carry on its way of life. That's amazing. It's just sort of a, just a little hint of what happened in the life of a T-Rex 68 million years ago. This detective work doesn't just apply to the forensics of how ancient animals lived and died. We use the same data interrogation approach to build a picture of those parts of our planet that will always be inaccessible to direct observation. There's no way we will ever get to sample the Earth's core, but what we can do is listen to our planet. Whenever there's a big earthquake, the Earth will ring like a bell, and we can listen to this like a musical instrument. And the strength and the sense of these vibrations tells us about the rock which they've passed through, and so we can build up a picture of our planet. Another way of finding out more about the Earth's core is to look at meteorites. For my final year undergrad project, I'm looking at iron meteorites. These are fragments of early planets which were smashed to pieces four and a half billion years ago. We think these metal fragments are similar to the Earth's core. They contain changes in chemistry and magnetism on a nanometer scale, and this might hold secrets into how the cores of early planets formed. In order to see such tiny features clearly and to decode the record left in the meteorites, we need a specific instrument called a synchrotron. At the Berlin Synchrotron in Germany, 
electrons are accelerated close to the speed of light around a circular path. As they accelerate, they emit an intense beam of X-rays that allows us to probe the chemical and magnetic makeup of the meteorite at the nanometer scale. The earliest geologists had to rely only on what they could see in the field. Today, we can combine our field observations with a huge range of sophisticated techniques, encompassing cutting-edge developments across the whole range of scientific disciplines. It used to be said that the best geologist was the person who'd seen the most rocks. Even with all the new ways of observing the Earth, there's still some truth in that. So we make it a priority to bring our students into the field and to teach them how to observe rocks and to interpret them. I really enjoy the trips that we go on. Uh, you get to spend all day in the field and then socialising in the evenings. It means you're on first name terms with uh, your lecturers and your supervisors, which is really nice. I had no intention of studying earth sciences when I came up to university, but I thought I'd give it a go as my fourth option. And after the first few lectures, I just got really hooked. Um, the content was really interesting. It was a really, really broad course. And I just wanted to keep on coming back to find out more. Earth science graduates are actually some of the most employable students at the university. The undergraduate course provides a skill base in numerical and analytical techniques, as well as problem solving. And it means that we're attractive to the mining and oil industries, but also to things like the government, the civil service, and even things like journalism and science communication and publishing. If you're considering earth sciences at Cambridge, you will have done science already at school. And what you'll do here is learn to take the science that you know and apply it in new and interesting ways to try and tackle problems that you won't have even considered before, such as you know, how did the solar system form, how did the Earth itself form, and how has it developed over the last four and a half billion years. The great thing about Cambridge, as far as I was concerned, was it opened shutters on the world. I looked through windows and saw vistas that I didn't know even existed. There was a university lecturer here called Dr. Bulmer, and Dr. Bulmer was working on things called graptolites, which I've never seen before in my life and he allowed me to look down his microscope and see that these fretsaw blades, in fact, were little sockets and that there were cylindrates, there were little tiny coral polyps that, 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 that sort of things, which were living along these gaps. Suddenly, you know, a huge, huge vista opens. The Earth Sciences course at Cambridge will introduce you to exciting problems ranging from the atomic scale right up to the scale of plate tectonics. We'll give you the skills to tackle them and begin to make a real impact in the scientific world. If you've already got your place to read Natural Sciences at Cambridge or are considering whether to apply here, you might be wondering which subjects to choose for your first year. Earth Sciences provides the opportunity to apply your primary interest in physics, chemistry or biology to some of the most challenging and important scientific problems in the greatest laboratory of all.